my name is Lau Kin Chi. I am coordinator of the program on cultures of sustainability, Center for Cultural Research and Development, Lingnan University. I'm also director of the executive team of the Global University for Sustainability. We have always wanted to facilitate better understanding and solidarity among the peoples of East Asia and of Asia and share our experiences for peace and life. Today, we have three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon of Asian time for a deep exchange. We have invited two speakers each from Japan, Korea, and China for presentation and dialogue. Each speaker will speak for 30 minutes. In the morning session, we first have 60 minutes on Japan from the two speakers, then 30 minutes for question and answer. We will take a break of five minutes, then go into the second half. As Mr. Guja, uh, Guja Ren from Korea is not available in the morning, we will have one speaker from Korea and one speaker from China in the morning, each with 30 minutes, uh, followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. In the afternoon, we will have one speaker from Korea and one speaker from China for 90 minutes, take a break of five minutes, and then go into a round table discussion among the speakers from the three countries. We have made special efforts to overcome language barriers so that we can speak in our mother tongue. We are very grateful to the seven interpreters today for helping with the communication. Thanks to Dong Han Yu and Pei Hai Tong for interpreting in Chinese and English. Thanks to Ji uh, Yun Rong and Guo, Guo, Guo Yong Mei for interpreting in Chinese and Korean. And thanks to Hu Dong Zhu, Liu Jia Jun, and Wang Yi Nan for interpreting in Chinese and Japanese. Putonghua Chinese will be used as the relay language. I would like to introduce the moderator for the morning session. Professor Lee Jong Ok is Emeritus Professor of Daegu Catholic University of South Korea. She previously served as Minister of Gender Equality and Family under President Moon Jae-in from 2019 to 2020. She is Senior Advisor and is President of the Korean Association of NGO Studies. She was also the co-chair of Gender Equality Committee of Ministry of National Defense, co-president of Women's Forum for Peace and Diplomacy, and chair of International Cooperation Committee of Korea Democracy Foundation. She is a former member and chair of Public Interest Activity Promotion, a nonprofit organization, Committee of Seoul Metropolitan Government. She is also a founding member of the Global University. So now over to you, uh, Professor Lee. Thank you, Kinchi and Margaret. So good morning and uh, good for someone, good afternoon and also good evening. I am deeply honored to moderate this meaningful session, overcoming all language barriers on rural regeneration in East Asia under the umbrella of a tense South South Forum on sustainability with a special focus on thinking new horizons. So today we are going to share the information, knowledge, and especially the will for regenerating rurality in East Asia. So we, through very rapid urbanization and industrialization, the rural sector became more and more marginalized in East Asia. In this juncture, the excellent panelists tried their best to not only to regenerate rurality, but also transform the society towards more eco-friendly and cooperative community. In, the, in this session, we have four excellent speakers uh, so each speaker 
So Kenji already introduced the time frame. So each speaker can take around 30 minutes to save time for Q&A. So I will briefly introduce the four speakers to, to know who are they. <laughs> so first, uh, Ono or Kajoki, uh, he is an independent agricultural journalist. Uh, he has been traveling rural areas all over the country, reporting the real voices and situation of small farmers, critically analyzing the Japanese government's agricultural policy in the last 60 years. Ono is actively involved in networking with Asian farmers, especially with Thailand and Philippines. He also had traveled to different countries such as China and Vietnam, etc. He also helps to organize the migrant workers in his community. So oh, I heard Ono is not in good condition, but uh, he has participated in this meaningful session. So, and also I will introduce the second speaker, Hikida Michiko. Michiko. He is the one of the founders of Shirakata Nuranokai, which is the joint enterprise cooperative in Shirakata town in Yamakata prefecture. Shirakata Nuranokai is composed of local producers and they organized this business union to link with the consumers nationwide directly to deliver their fresh vegetables, rice and processing product. So both of them came from Japan. And uh, from, from Korea, I introduced Ju Hyungmo. He has initiated, he, he, he has initiated eco-friendly agricultural production and a real farmer and uh, uh, community building in Mundangni, Hongsang County in South Korea. His innovative approaches have made him to be the vice president of Correct Agriculture Association and one of the 100 future leaders in Korea. He has endeavored urban rural solidarity building. He received many prizes from uh, President Kim Dae-jung and also Daesan Agri-Leader Award. It is a farmer's Nobel, P Nobel Prize in Korea. <clears throat> he emphasized community building through eco-friendly agricultural production, <clears throat> research, and education. So last but not least, Yan Xiaohui <clears throat> with the program on culture of sustainability, Center for Cultural Research and Development, Lingnan University, Hong Kong, China. He is executive director of Green Ground Ecotech Center in Beijing and director of the Green Ground Alliance of Social Enterprise in China. He is also one of the founding members of Global University. So we have, we have very precious speakers. Uh, so thanks to the uh, Ginchi and the Jades uh, organizing effort. And also thanks to the interpreter, we can uh, cross the boundaries of our language, so share our deep experience. So starting with Ono first, now the floor is yours, Ono. Will you start? It is my honor to participate in this South South Forum on Sustainability. Can you hear me? Yeah. Today, I would like to share with you the agriculture condition in Japan. Please allow me to do some basic introduction of our background. A brief review on Japanese agriculture and our future outlook. I wish you could be interested in my study. Actually, generally speaking, 
the agriculture rural problems. In 1955, after the Second World War happened in Japan, we embarked our demographic reform. After that, we witnessed a juncture point that is in the eight decades after the Second World War, we established a new agriculture structure, but now this structure is being decontrusted. As we can see from the statistics made by the authority of Japan, could you please help me present my picture sent to you? Yes, exactly this one. On this slide, as you can see, this is this is the number of agricultural producers and patents. As you can interpret, they are the full-time agricultural producers who are the pillars of Japanese agriculture. They're very important. For the green bulk, the three green bulk show us a rapid decline of the number of peasants in Japan. Sorry, please wait me for a minute. Could you hear me? Yes. As you can see on the slide, there's a decline in patterns in farmland. Many elderly patterns are living in those areas. Their average age is at about 69 years old. And over 70% of those people are aging over 70 years old. So here's the fact. And there's a rapid decline in the patterns and the population is aging rapidly in those areas in rural Japan. So here's the first feature of Japanese agriculture in modern society. The newly added patterns under the age of 49 was only 18,000 in 2020 nationwide. As I have mentioned just now, the average age of peasants is 68 and now it is 69. In next year, it is suggested to be as old as 70 years old. Could you please show us the second picture that I just sent to you? Yes, right, this one. The aging population and the decline of patterns have aroused many problems, as you can see on this slide. Here's the statistics. And also there is a decline in food price, such as the price decline in rice. Rice is the pillar corp and the staple food for Japanese society. And during the COVID-19, its price is going down fastly. At the beginning of the 21st century, the number of price of rice, as you can see on the left, is 20,000 yen, and now the price only at 10,000 yen. It declined by half.
but our cost is 15,000. If we sell them for 10,000, then there will be 500 yen at loss. So no more peasants will be willing to sow rice in their land. We see no future in agriculture and a few people like to participate in this industry. So here's the second problem. So as the result, here are some figures. You can see the self-sufficiency rate, the great line, it is declining. According to the calorie, the self-sufficiency of rice, what well, of rice is 38%. It used to be 73% in 1965, and it is declining. And the overall production of the agriculture is also decreasing. As for the agricultural land, it declines from 4 million of 4.59 million in 2010 to 4.35 million hectare in 2021. And the abandoned agricultural land increased from 278,000 hectares in 2011 to 282,000 hectares in 2020. So the agricultural land has transformed to the abandoned land or the forests. So the agriculture is collapsing in the regions. And as mentioned, our self-sufficiency rate is quite low, which means we have to be dependent on the import of the food, especially the grains. From certain countries, for example, our dependency rate of the corn is 64%, and we are very dependent um, the U.S. import and the soybean is 71%, the wheat is 41%. Which means that we can only be self-sufficient on rice. And we can see that we cannot satisfy our demands with our own production. And due to the Ukraine war, we have new problems. Because our import is dependent on certain specific countries. So it causes the rise of the price of this import food. For example, we are 90% dependent, uh, dependent of the fertilizer raw material, more specifically the phosphoric acid from China. And here's another picture. This is in Xinxi town.
at that time, the price of the rice is quite, was quite high. They planted there and farmed the rice. But now it is a wasted land. And it turned into this. It used to be farmland, but now it is abandoned. And this kind of lands can be seen everywhere in Japan right now. And next picture. This is where I live right now. It's a two hour ride from Tokyo. It's in mountain. It used to be a fertilized land for cucumbers. But now it is also wasted. And the farming facilities for rice and vegetables are also wasted. So what does this mean? Here's what I think. In the 1930s, Japan invaded Asia. And we have colonized the invasion in the North Korea. We launched a full war to Asia. We started by invading China in 1946. We attacked the Poro in US. And in 1945, we announced failure. Why is that? We need to carry the accountability for launching the wars. For example, we need to be accountable for the economy and the land. And when we failed, we faced many farmers' movements. So we had the land reform. And some reform was carried out by the government. They gave the land to the farmers. the small farmers. So the self-cultivating farming system became the main form of the Japanese agriculture. And many self-cultivating farmers emerges. They have their own land, and they cultivate by household. So that's the change along the economic transformation. The self-cultivating farming is still rise in the fundamentals in the Japanese economy. And by law, it is still there.
And we also have the self-cultivating industries, but now it is collapsing. Over the eight decades since the failure of the Japan's war, they have been, we have been facing the collapsing of the self-cultivating farming system. We have the form there. It has regulated, it is stipulated by the law that we will never launch the war. And we can keep, uh, keep this self-cultivating farming system by law. But our productivity is dismantling. So what does the government do? We have two directions. First is smart agriculture. We use AI and the machines to have efficient agricultural production for like the autonomous tractors. They're in use now. or we use them in processing procedures and we use the GIFT and other biotech technologies to increase our productivity. And make our production more smooth. We also, attract foreign experts. We have a agriculture internship system. There are 40,000 to 50,000 members. They're, they used to be from China mainly, but now it's mainly from Philippines. Philippine. We have little laborers right now. We don't have enough people in agriculture industry. So this foreign farmer system has give us many laborers, but it has its defaults. And it is pointed out by the United Nations and according to US, they believe it's like slavery because the foreign laborers are not treated fair enough. They have to keep working. And it's hard for them to leave this industry. Because of this system, they have to stay in Japan for three years. And there are many objections against this system. So the government will make some adjustments to it the, since the next year. First, it will extend the term from three years to five years. We will use more native laborers and we will take the families of these foreign farmers into Japan. And we will introduce more AI technology to help them for higher efficiency. And we will attract more foreign farmers to come to Japan. So technology and foreign laborers are our two directions. A 
A huge problem that Japan faces right now is the lack of labor in agriculture. We need to do the field research to make sure that the policies of the government can be carried out. To the final part of my speech, what can we do? First, I have to say I do not have a complete measure. I have experienced the lead reform and the self uh, the self-cultivating farming system. And I grew up in the small villages in the mountains. I grew up as the children of the farms. I re remember that the grown-ups were the, the self-cultivating policies were welcomed by the grown-ups and I have been working on this. So I have some thoughts on this. I'm 83 years old right now. When I was born, there they started the self-cultivating system and now it is ending. So what can we do? We cannot allow it to collapse. First, in agriculture, there are many people who live on agriculture. This is a good thing. It's helpful for us to solve the problems. And we need to see it in a more macro perspective when we are talking about our problems. First, we need to raise the salary for the farmers. It is declining right now. And it ranks at the bottom in the, age, in the Asian area. If the salary continues to decline and they cannot afford the costs of their livelihood, then the agriculture won't be good. We need to give them salaries for their production of safe and high quality products. And we can also make adjustments on rice prices. The price is low for household. It's half of the income. And the salary for women is also low. They are like working for free. So we need to raise the salary for them. We need to solve these problems for the women farmers. There are also many other problems. We need to work together with the laborers. We need a peaceful environment so we can keep the self-cultivating farming system. We have relevant constitution, but now we need to make some adjustments. We want to conduct the revolution of agriculture in the midst of a peaceful condition. And additionally, we still face a problem of food security and food safety. We should guarantee 
the catering for Japanese people, and I strongly stand against the problems of letting people starve. We should guarantee the food supply for our people. No matter nationality, gender, age, and where you live, we should guarantee the food supply for all our people. The fundamental food supply should be guaranteed in our agricultural industry. And I tend to call it the democracy of agriculture. Broad arena. And I will continue our work. Thank you, Onu san. Uh, thanks to your extensive analysis on Japanese agri realities and covering historical process and the current situation. Okay, so just a bit. And also some of the your government current uh, the some kind of the policy. Uh, recommendation also very useful for us all in East Asia. I think uh, your analysis can be um, very meaningful, uh, not only in Japan, but also in Korea and also uh, China, which has followed very rapid industrialization and uh, they are also production oriented policy. So in that sense, uh, we, we, we can understand that uh, many of, uh, in Korea, also, so many of these situations can be discussed later also. So thank you for your wonderful presentation. So now we, we are going to invite the second speaker, Hikida Mitsuko, uh, from Japan also, uh, because it, he, she has uh, uh, pioneered to solve the situation, the, the imbalances between urban sector and the rural sector as uh, already Ono has uh, designated. So how to some kind of mutually, uh, mutually productive uh, coexistence, coexistence can be possible. So uh, in that sense, uh, we will uh, appreciate uh, uh, Mitsuko Hikita's presentation. Now the floor is yours. I, I can, do not consider myself as a leader. I am still a peasant, actually. Peasant is leader. <laughs> Nowadays, I am mm. working in buying village and I'm a peasant here. In my 20s and 30s, I worked in Palico in Tokyo. That was an NGO working on agriculture issues. And I worked on the relationship between rural and urban areas. I have a lot of experience on this front. And later on, I was dedicated in agriculture development. I have experienced both in urban areas and the rural areas. And I am quite familiar with the advantages and the problems to be solved in both areas. So I think I have this condition and knowledge to share with you at this session. 30 years ago in 1991, I moved here. Just as mentioned by Kazuoki, there is a problem of aging population in rural areas, and I can feel it as well. Eighteen thousand population here, but today the number has declined to twelve thousand. First, the birth rate is quite low today. I have two sons. 
They, the kindergarten, they used to study in only have about one half of the students compared to the number when my son went to that kindergarten. So this can demonstrate the low birth rate. And we also face a problem of aging population. The urban rural difference is quite prominent. With a low birth rate in rural areas, the elderly patterns can only live on their own, live by themselves. We have a lot of elderly singles. Thirty years ago, I came here. Twenty percent of our population were were working on agriculture. Today, the number was only ten percent. Recently. The agricultural problems are very intensive, especially the natural disasters. In Japan, there are a lot of rainstorm disasters. The governments are trying to solve this problem. Because the Rainstorm disasters has caused a lot of floods problems and even mudslide and landslide problems. In 2003, because of the landslide caused by rainstorm, there was a severe problem and disaster happening in the agriculture industry, as mentioned by our previous speaker, Ono Kazuoki. Over the last eight decades after the Second World War, after the rapid urbanization of Japan, there has been huge changes and transformation happening in the agriculture sector. All kinds of fertilizers, Pesticides are being used in the farmland. And there are many wasted and abandoned farmland left here because capitalism needs to make profits. The natural forests are being abandoned and destroyed. In many problems, the deforestation problems is very intensive and a lot of trees, profitable trees are being planted for the sake of housing industry. That is also a profits issue. And during the high and the rapid urbanization period, there are more and more people moving to urban areas and fewer people are left here to protect the forest here. So in terms of forests, they are undergoing a lot of problems against the natural law. When rainstorm disasters happen, there will be floods. And in my area, in Baiyin village, this phenomenon is quite prominent. I'm now working on agriculture by myself. The intensive agriculture is also a problem.
this year, the sweet potatoes I grown have been consumed. There's a quite lower birth rate, fewer population, a wasted and abandoned agriculture, a damaged and destroyed at atmosphere and environment. So our pandas living is not that good given this condition. And we're also working on the organic agriculture in 2006. We established a small organization named named organic agriculture. We worked on organic vegetables. By selling the vegetables for quite a low price, we cannot support our livelihood. So we choose to make some processing work on our produce. After the processing, our produce can be sold for a higher price without any waste of them. We also can use the produce for more value added products such as the pickles, the kimchi, the stinky rice products. All those products can be sold for a higher price together with the organic vegetables after the processing work. But we still cannot support ourselves very well. We only have a dozen of people starting from a very small organization working on organic production. But for some reasons, we only have seven members today. So it is a very small organization with little strength, but we are still continuing our life by selling our homegrown vegetables, those organic vegetables, especially, as I have mentioned right now. We live quite close to forest. We have a lot of natural forest surrounding us. Generation by generation, the peasants living here support themselves with the help of forests. So we live on the sources given by the forest. And this produces grown by ourselves, like vegetables and the beans, and we also process them for a higher price. How do we establish our organization and how do we form this business mode? It's because the organic agricultural industry in Japan has been developed since the 1970s. We have a good history. The organic agriculture in Japan has been provided good products for the consumers for a long time and we have a healthy consumption campaign that has encouraged the patents to work on organic production permanently. It is also a kind of patent campaign for consumers and patents. The two groups are correlated with each other due to the organic production. So this is a historical experience. We also have a consumer group. Without the consumer committee, there will not be the organic agriculture in Japan. It is the committee that gives birth to the emergence of organic production in Japan. Our buy-in committee is also helped by the consumer committee in Japan. We learn from them and we 
ask them to help with us in marketing our products. So we are working in cooperation with each other. Half of our total profits come from the direct consumption towards consumers. The agriculture production together with the later on processing work make our products even better and even more valuable. We reach out to our customers by ourselves. We also sell our products for to the targeted consumers directly with the help of express delivery. And so, as you can see, we work on two modes with the help of customer committee and directly to the customers. You can see there are two ways. And we also work on farmer cooperatives. And then we also choose a way of incorporation, legal incorporation. We produce them, process them, and sell them in legal incorporations. That is our firm today. We only have seven members, but we are equal. We have the same voice here. We have the same say here. We invested equally and we gain equally. We can be self-reliant, be self-sufficient. We are a quite equal organization. With our seven members, maybe we couldn't do too much more, but we have some temporary helpers. For those temporary helpers, we also pay them for their labor here. About in the past 13 years, we have been organizing our group with the seven members. I'm no more young today. Only with our elderly people, we cannot do our work perfectly. We need more young strength and young power. I'm 70, I'm 67 years old right now. We have our pension to support our organization's activities. So it is our condition. But the young blood do not have pension. So maybe it is very difficult for them to participate in such organizations with fewer support. For the people in their 60s still working on this front. Caroline's are and they have their farmlands, so they are very happy about it. There are also many urban people who come here. Here is a concept. which means the harmonious coexistence of people and nature. The term is Satoyama. And I have mentioned the heavy rainfall. When that happens, we need to help each other to sustain ourselves.
We can collect the vegetables like the mushrooms, even in these kind of seasons, to sustain the production of agriculture, which is very important. And there is also a term which is hiaxio, which is a term refers to the common people who engage who are engaged in agriculture and lived in rural communities. And I get this word from a Korean soap opera. And I believe that the Korean colleagues and audience can also understand this word. I don't know if Chinese have this word. Anyway, there is this term in Japan. Some people may say this is discriminative. But my understanding is that people are in different walks of lives with different responsibilities. And hiakasio refers to the people who can work together and complete the jobs in all walks of fields. And we can participate in all different things. And in this way, the Japanese agriculture can survive and thrive. According to Ono Kazuki, we have known that the Japanese agriculture has great business value. And I believe that with our efforts, our agriculture will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Hikata Mitsuko. Uh, thank you for your wonderful experience and uh, challenges uh, to <clears throat> rebalance uh, in this industrialized society. So we are deeply moved that you are small, but very, <laughs> uh, very echoing uh, activities in your town not only for forests, uh, but also for the urban dwellers. So I think uh, it cannot be uh, some kind of judged by price value. So we, we, we uh, thanks to your presentation, we, we, are, uh, we are influenced by how to revaluation of every sector set because all those kind of uh, policy are based on the, uh, the price basis or the quantitative uh, product based. So uh, we, without revaluation, we cannot find uh, new horizons. So thank you again. So to Japanese, to Japanese, we are one is very macro analysis and policy level. One is uh, micro, but very meaningfully engaged with the uh, uh, the macro level of uh, structure. So, uh, because, uh, so we can have a uh, 10 minutes quick uh, Q&A for Japanese case. Can I ask a question? Uh, okay, okay, you too. <laughs> Thank you. I will ask in Chinese. Thank you very much for the two Japanese speakers. Uh, according to Ono Kazuki, he mentioned that we need a peaceful environment to make sure the farming of the self-cultivating farming system. My question is that, does the Japanese citizens or farmers understand the importance of a peaceful environment? Do they care about the policies? For example, the amendment of the constitution, what do they think about it? And how do they think about the enhancement of the friendship between China, Japan, and Korea? And Mr. Hikita, who is 70 years old, two years old, lower than the average. And she is a living experience. 
for health. My questions are as follows. First, I know that the Japanese CFA community supports the agriculture and many consumer organizations. My question is that the products of these organizations do they come from the local communities in Japan or from other countries like the Philippines? So do they buy from the local communities or from foreign countries? Another question, 30 years ago in 1991, you worked in Tokyo and then you made up your mind to go to the rural areas. I have heard that there are many examples of young people go to rural regions because of the protocol in 1985 in Japan, Japanese economy declined. So is that a reason why the young people go to the rural regions to work in agriculture? So can you please introduce the waves of situations about the young Japanese people go to work in agriculture in rural areas? Thank you. Uh, Margaret, will you also help us uh, any questions uh, from um, chatting box? Yes. And, uh, um, covering all the questions and uh, let them let them answer yeah um uh i have a question uh, i will speak in chinese uh please shift to uh chinese channel my question is that the nuclear disaster in uh fudao area how does it influence the japanese agriculture okay there are many questions so uh, Ono San, can you can you understand the whole questions from Kinchi and from the audience? So about the uh, about the issue on peace constitution and also the the ordinary people's responses and uh, how is the impact of the Fukushima reactor to agri agricultural sector? And also, uh, Misko Hikita, also how, how, and also the, the import of uh, every product uh, from foreign countries, whether only can be met uh, by Japanese production, and uh, how is the consumer's attitude? So many, <laughs> and, the, and, and also the generational, uh, her, gener generational heritage. So uh, many very important and uh, meaningful questions. So as you already confessed, we may not you you or we may not have an answer, but uh, find a threat to new horizons. So now I will first uh, answering flowers to Onosan. About the reactor situation in Fukushima. I want to give some simple remarks about the things that I know. The Fukushima reactor leads to destructive influences to many things, including the agriculture and the fishing industry. So under such circumstances, we can also take it as an opportunity to carry out a new agricultural system. And the, and the government has also some plans, for example, build a food processory factories there. 
and use the advanced technologies. So people do not need to work there. We can carry out the autonomous agriculture. And they want to make some agricultural experiments there. So we can pay attention to these plants. And we are now trying those in the Fukushima. There is also the pollution of the water. So the Japanese government is emitting this polluted water. There are many people who are against it and they have carried out dramatic movements against it. We also have fishing industrial institution who have showed their clear attitude of objection. But in agriculture, there is no strong objection. The objection is mainly in the fishing industry. So that's the basic situation. And the Japanese government is carrying out some projects. Domestically, the people do not have strong objection, but the staff working in the fishing industry have high voices against it. And they can only emit the polluted water when all Japanese people agree to it. I don't think that's quite possible. But over time, they may still do it. And they have the relevant plans. That's all I know. Thank you. And here are some takeaways from me. And here are something I know about the Fukushima. A group I know in the middle part of the Fukushima has been influenced by the huge earthquake. They work in the organic agriculture and the planting and the farming. Over the 12 years, they have been pondering about whether they will yeah, survive there. And some of them moved to the Changye town to do their agricultural farming. But most of the group members stayed. Many agricultural products are wasted because of the disaster and the radioactive influence. The government have made some subsidies and compensations. And there are support from the scholars in Japan. And they have tests for all these radioactive influences. And there is a place called Envy. They only sell the products who have passed the quality tests. But people do not trust it, so they cannot sell the products that even passed the tests. It's not quite well, but we are hanging out. And there are consumer 
associations and organizations who purchase these qualified products and make tests on it and sell them to consumer associations like in uh, areas around the Fukushima. And there are groups who do not know about the radioactive issue. Some believe that the atomic radioactive processing is a good thing. But then they realized that might lead to disaster. So now they believe only by removing it, the agriculture can be promoted. So they are working on the organic agriculture. At the same time, they are also working on the solar energy to provide the energy for the agriculture, like planting the grapes. And they have been working on it in large areas. There is a movie about it. You can look for it if you are interested in this issue. The Consumer Association mainly take products from the local communities. Of course, there are ex ex imported products like the bananas from Philippines. There are consumer associations like that, but mainly it's from the local communities. Some of the committee only sell products that are imported from overseas countries. But our committee focus more on our domestically grown products. And some people from Tokyo even come to rural areas to play the role of peasants. One son of me is living together with me right now and another son is living in Tokyo. But my child living in city areas is also willing to come back to the rural areas for help. In harvest season, they also tend to go back home to help me in agricultural works. Some young people who are tired of the busy work in big cities are coming back to the rural areas like my hometown by in village to do the agriculture activities. But with the salary given by our committee, the young people cannot live on themselves. So they have to work on the agriculture activities for one source of salary. And they also need to seek for another work like do the nursing work for another part of their income. So I think the income of rural activities for the young people is a problem. We need to raise the salary of all agricultural workers. These problems is imperatively needed to be solved. So that is my speaking and that's all my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful questions and uh, uh, very uh, realistic answers uh, for those uh, questions. So, uh, because uh, there are many uh, interesting questions, so we want to, if, if there is any more question, we want to give some time for Japanese session. So any other question is there? Okay, if not, so we are we are go into the Korean session, and uh, for the remaining questions, we will do uh, in the afternoon roundtable session. So thank you, Ono Sang and uh, Ms. Ko Hikita Sang, so uh, for sharing your long experience and uh, your wisdom 
and also some kind of a good advice for the future generation to, uh, in this juncture. So thank you again. So now I, I will invite uh, Chu Hyung No uh, from Korea. So uh, I already uh, introduced his uh, background to you. So, but uh, according to his uh, original CV, mm -hmm. I cannot introduce all. So he can introduce himself also through presentation. So now floor is yours. Hyung No, Chu Hyung No. Good morning, everyone. It is my honor to be here to attend this webinar together with all of you. Previously, I have been engaged in some online webinars working on the discussion of agriculture. So this time, as I have mentioned before, many countries in the world are facing problems in their agricultural sector. It is a common problem. And how could we stay promising on this front? And how should we address these problems? And today I'd like to share with you some of my insights on this front. Me myself is a director of the Agriculture Education Center in Hongsun Environment, South Korea. I invested a lot and my organization invested a lot in the development and education work in rural areas in South Korea. I have been engaged in this project for as long as four years. And I believe the rural areas in my area is better. And then our country can be better as well. Taking the 100 years of history, I wrote this book. And in this book, we share some of our wisdoms and knowledge in rural development. And based on this condition, let me briefly introduce you some of the information about South Korea rural development. And here, as you can see on this slide, I'd like to take an example. This is a picture shot by my mobile phone. There are mountains, farmlands in this picture. Here's the farmland in South Korea. Accidentally, this farmland exactly show us the landscape of South Korea, the natural landscape and the conditions in our region. So as suggested by our nation, I will be responsible for the rural development based on the condition of our true natural landscape with farmlands and mountains. And in this book, there are also some rural development suggestions. And here, please enjoy this short video clip. Uh, 네, 한번 보시고 계속하겠습니다. 
Okay, that's all. Can you see this video? The sunflower on this slide is the hope and promising future for our rural residents. It is a symbol of hope. Then one by one, we are doing promising work. Our peasants hope is a healthy development of the agriculture. In our region, we have 3,500 peasants living here. For instance, there are many problems happening in the rural areas of South Korea. One of the most prominent ones is the decline of rural students and young people. In some schools, there are only 50 or even 45 students in one school. And in my area, in one school, we have about 60 students. Additionally, my area has witnessing a beautiful development of agriculture. And in this beautiful city, countryside, our students are living happily. So I think my area is quite promising. Our region and landscape is just as shown in the previous slide. Our focus is education, organic agriculture and farmers cooperative. The three elements is our most competitive features and advantages. They are also of strong economic value. Economically speaking, they are eco-friendly, environmentally friendly, and culture friendly. They are our strengths. And here, in terms of education, I'd like to share with you our experience and story. We have a small school in our region with 60 years of history. And in our school, we have a missionary and a director of education He is in charge of the educational work here. There is a cooperation between the church and the education. We focus on labor and education. Through this type of cooperation, we can bring better educational services for our residents here. What's more, we also establish a talent center working for the training of women engaged in agricultural sector. And our Women are working together to produce food specifically served for our children. And we also have the children oriented facilities. Instead of merely studying in the classroom, we also offer them many more outdoor activities to get them close to nature. Here, as you can see on the slide, is the picture of our elementary school. They are provided with the opportunities to go into farmlands and do some agricultural stuff. Those students in primary school can gain some agricultural activity experiences and knowledge.
They also have supervisors working together with them. So there is an interaction between the elderly and the young. So this type of education is not temporary. It is permanent. We have been working on it for quite a long time. Many people argue that this type of education mode may be very difficult to carry on, but we still stick to it. And we are agriculture oriented. We train our children and teach them how to do the agriculture labor. And here, as you can see on the slide, is a picture celebrating the years of development of our education in rural areas. And those students are college students. This project is also targeted to embark on a new way of development in rural areas. In this college, there is a library, and we also receive subsidies granted from the nation. This library is served for the local people and is prepared for our local students and peasants. And we have run this library for five years. And we have now paid off all our mortgages in building it. In this library, we also have discussion on its further development. So we are development oriented. Apart from our study, we also conduct educational projects and programs in this library, apart from the daily study. Previously, we thought that all we should do is to take care of our own children. Today, we've changed our mindset that we should develop all our children all together for the whole community. Some people can teach mathematics and some can teach arts. We can provide our students with all kinds of courses and equip them with all kinds of abilities and the capabilities. So with this cooperation and efforts, we can sustain this type of education for quite a long time. On this slide, as you can see, we have many disabled people in our rural areas and these projects and the facilities are provided specifically for the disabled group. Those disabled people can also dedicate to our work with their efforts. And here they are gathered together to build this house and the facility. And this location is provided for the young to do some craftsmanship activities. And here is an environmentally friendly farmland run by myself. And we also can receive some subsidies granted by the national government. The significance of agriculture and food is recognized by our nation. With that principle, we run this project. And we reserve this farmland to provide targeted and a specific agricultural training. That is where we can impart this knowledge to the young. And we also have some farmer cooperatives in rural areas. And here are all the agricultural cooperative organizations. In those areas, 
they have their own work. They are working on improving these organizations. So the farmers will do the production. And the selling will be performed by another organization. So the farmers can be assured with the marketing and they can focus on the agriculture production. In this way, they can also integrate their efforts to improve the development of this rural area. So this is cooperation in agriculture. And we have a 15 years of experience in this kind of cooperation. And this is the Goodwill Credit Union. They can give financial support to the farmers. They work on the rural development and the financing, like the communities and the microbial factory. This is the Pomo Student Union. So, the students will work on the selling. And they will process the wheat into products. And here is a marketing union of the elder people. The grandmas can work together. So in 2012, they had launched this grandma market and they will sell the products. This is very special. There is a community clinic in a rural area in Korea. It is supported by the people in the community. And the money that they collect are used in the clinic project. So the name is Our Neighborhood Clinic. And this clinic is very beautiful on the outlook and it is welcomed by many people. The salary is low, but the staff is very willing to work there and provide service to the community people. And it is estimated that their salary will be raised. And this is a cooperative farm organized by the youngsters. The youngsters who want to work in the rural areas can participate in this program. And so the youngsters who work in the cities can go to this farm if they want to go to the rural areas and participate in the agricultural production. And this is also a 
scenario and the environment for their workplace. And this is a place we build for people to chat and enjoy. We have regular community activities to enhance their solidarity and friendship. And this is a cooperative called Green Nest Cooperative for the rural women. This cooperative was established by seven members in April 2016. In this cooperative, they produce and sell the organic rice breads and provide the experience of organic food. They have full experience in the organic food. They also provide the field trip service for the primary school and middle school students so they can learn agricultural knowledge in this environment. I'd like to take this opportunity to expand my regard to the founder of the organic agriculture in Japan, Godani Chunichi. After the war, career is in destruction. So the Japanese have provided us with their support and Godani Juichi has taken the organic agricultural method to Korea. So in the 1970s, we can operate on the organic agriculture and improve our productivity. And in 1975, Godani Junichi come to Purmu Agricultural Technology School. And we provide the religious people an organization by cooperation with local agricultural communities for our religious people. The people in the right, the person is me. I introduced the organic agricultural method in Japan to Korea, and I have introduced the duck farming industry. We use the organ organic ducking duck farming system to improve the agricultural productivity. The person on the left is my tutor. In 1994, we introduced this organic duck farming system. My tutor, give her abundant experience in organic agriculture to all the local communities. She is a very kind and helpful lady. This is our village called Mundan Ecological Farming Village. This is a base to protect the environment. 
we took organic methods on duck farming to promote the agriculture in this village. Therefore, we name it the Mundan Ecological Farming Village. We gave many trainings and experience to the primary school students and their parents to tell them about this organic method. Through this organic duck farming method, we have made a plan for a century. And we have shared the enjoyment in this practice. And we have met, accumulated many experiences. The book on the right was published 20 years ago. So the name of the book is the 100 year plan program for the Mundan Ecological Farming Village. I'd like to send my regard to all the people who support our work in the village. There are also many small businesses and cooperatives in this village, and they have built many programs. This is a production base of milk. The Fort Moon techno, uh, vocations, no, vocation students come here to provide us with help. The graduates, some graduates also live in the community and build a family. This is the Salian cooperation in the local community who produce rice crisps and rice breads. This is also a farm for the retired elderly. They work in this farm to kill their time. And this is the Sky community cooperative. They can solve the problems for the poor people. This is a village that I live in. It is called Hanul village. It is collaboratively established by some small cooperatives. It's a very friendly and a community of solidarity. And the design is from the German style in the rural regions. The picture has shown that the youngsters are working together in our community. We have make our own money, called the leaf money. So the only way to promote the agriculture and the farm is cooperation. This is what I have always believed in. Only by cooperation, we can improve and revive the economy in the rural areas. Then I will show you swiftly the scenarios we have created in the rural areas. 
this these are the two gods. The man on the left is the god of heaven. The woman on the right is the god of earth. And we have teach our children to get interested in agriculture. So we provide them with education in agriculture since they were young. The parents would take their kids to the field to understand agriculture and to feel the enjoyment and teach them some knowledge. And these are our farming lands. And this is the catfish that we have cultivated with our symbiotic farming method utilizing fresh water fish species. We use organic methods to cultivate these catfish and other freshwater fish species. We also use the organic methods in other freshwater fishes like the rice eel. We also use the organic farming methods on our meat ducks. Next, I will tell you the value of agriculture. The products bring us value. Above the water, we have the rice, and in the water, we have ducks and fishes. So this is a systematic method of agriculture. And these are the kids who live and grow up in our community. We can see them everywhere in the communities and we feel the enjoyment when seeing them. They are the hope of our future of agriculture. The food in this basket is sent to the patients in our community. This is the natural scenery in our community. These are the sceneries along the bank, and these are the ducks, and this is the alleys in the farmland. And this is the winter scenery. There are many people come here to visit our village. So we have specially built a scenery for outsiders to come here to visit so they can enjoy the beauty of our village and the fruitment of our agricultural methods. And students from primary or middle schools can come here to experience the agricultural production, to enjoy the process and gain some knowledge so we can inspire them to love agriculture and the rural communities. These are the birds in our community and the products. We advocate organic and environmental friendly methods. So there are many wildlife like these birds come to our village. This is a heart shape that we built with our products. 
we want to show that we love our agriculture very much with huge passion. And this sunflower represents our hope for future agriculture. And here is a speech from a game hall, a motto from him. To kill time, we think about what to feed the cow and it starved to death. So compared with 100 debates, 100 speeches, and 100 conferences, it's better to make some porridge and food for the cow. And who do the work is our working staff. So we need to do more practices in agricultural. This is a, this is a motto from a movement activist. And we hope that more youngsters can go to the rural areas to do the work in agriculture. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, uh, Zhu Hyungno. Uh, so he, he tried to build hope based on his own uh, village. So uh, make, a re, make a certain revaluation of uh, agri sector, not only the production, but also some uh, kind of uh, landscape and the community and the, some, some kinds of uh, art, which is not priced by economic value. So, uh, so he he emphasized the education first. So the education has come from the his previous uh, um, his previous teachers, and also he tried to convey that kind of teachings to the next generation. And during this process, based on the education, he has created many cooperatives uh, based on their people's need by their own autonomous way of organization. So we can see his cases and that he has planning for the 100 years forward on this basis. So, so it is better to, we have another presentation in the afternoon, but in case if there is any question right now for the Korean case, will you do it? And thank you very much, uh, uh, Ju Hyung Ro, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I am really impressed to see what you have done in your lifetime so far. I I have to ask because your ex your 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 community in Munlangri goes against the values of the capitalist industrial world. Many of our education systems in the region emphasizes industrialization, urbanization, and profit maximization, personal satisfaction from profit maximization. But your community goes the other way. Can you explain how you deal with this tension because while one a lot of majority of society goes one way, you are pulling in the other way. How do you deal with this tension to convince people who have been indoctrinated with the capitalist, industrialist profit motive to join you and to, to build new alternatives? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, is there, if there is a, if there are other questions, Let's combine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ju, for your impressive presentation. You have shown us a very beautiful picture of rural areas in Korea that is very inspiring for all of us. 
and I even willing to visit you tomorrow. And my question is quite similar to the question proposed by Andrew. In your community, you resort to education to inspire the young to love agriculture. And you also show us the value of agriculture. As we all know, the relationship between human and nature, between human and land is of great significance in our traditional agricultural society. And I wonder whether your thoughts can be popularized in modern society and whether your traditional value can be recognized by the modern society. Will your perspectives be challenged by the modern society and what methods have been adopted in your community to reserve the tradition? And just has mentioned by Ono Kazuoki, the average age of age population in rural areas is aging. So I think the situation in Korea will be the same. In your speech, you also show us your love for your community. And you have a 100 years of plan for the future generation. Some indigenous people are also trying to plan for their future generations. And our actions then ha may have negative impact for our future generation. Those actions should be canceled out. And in your centenary goal, how will you preserve your tradition and what actions will be deleted for their negative impacts for the future generations? I have two questions. For the first one, it is about the sovereignty and the property of the land. Maybe I think this question can be saved for the afternoon discussion session. And my second question, uh, my first question goes for our Korean and Japanese speakers. If the young people living in cities want to go back to rural areas for agriculture activities in terms of the land property rights, I think whether there will be favorable conditions provided for them. And for my second question, as far as I know, in 1970s in South Korea, there were a rural revitalization and a renewal campaign. I wonder whether that renewal campaign has some similarities sharing with today's rural regeneration problem. That is my question. Thank you, Margaret. So, uh, to, can you can you can you take all questions? For the first question, I think it is a broad one. In many other countries, they have the same problems in urbanization, modernization, and its contradiction against agriculture. Previously, we have our traditional mode. But with decades of transformation and changes, I think it should be changed and renewed. And the young population are leaving the rural areas and it is condition. The traditional mode should be changed. And the new mode is generated and established day by day generally and gradually. So I think it is quite a pity to see so many young people living in rural areas. The there is a saying very popular in the rural areas in Japan, without education, people will be monsters. So they pursue more education. I wish more and more young people can go back to the rural regeneration plan in countryside. And I think some people once questioned that, how would you like to sustain your life and make a living with the opening up of the agriculture in South Korea? With 
continuous accumulation of experience we have overcome many difficulties. We focus on agriculture for the sake of the well-being of the whole nation. We pursue high production rate. But in the pursuit of high yield, wars emerged, conflicts emerged. So I think the future should still be focusing on the economic developments of rural areas and the education on this front should be carried out at a very young age for the young population in rural areas. We needed to establish their right value and inspire their love for rural area. Education is a good starting point. It is a science-oriented approach. Only in this way can we produce good values. Patents are the artists working on the farmland, just as what is being done by artists on paper. So patents are artists with souls of hope. We are the magicians that can bring life to the land. So we should carry out various types of agriculture production and let the beautiful art of agriculture to attract more people be participating in our sector. And we should let them see the future of agriculture and get them in. So long before I published this book, of the 100 years of plan of agriculture development in South Korea. When I was writing this book, I saw the seed of hope. Today, it is finally harvested. We have fruitful results. We are no longer differentiating producers and consumers. When consumers are in need of their goods, they can still be the producers. There shouldn't be a clear or absolute boundary between consumers and producers. Both of them are consumers and producers at the same time. Peasants need food as well. So in our rural areas, our farmer cooperatives is running well. Many non-agriculture personnel are part of us as well. They are consumers and peasants at the same time. They do agricultural work here and they enjoy a lot here. So these two groups of people should no longer be differentiated and separated from each other. Consumers and producers are the same group of people. This is our concept. In our cooperatives, they are the same group of people. Mm -hmm. 선생님, 그 혹시 그 토지 소유권의 문제, 토지 소유권의 그 문제, 토지 소유권의 소유권의 문제라든가. 또그 70년대 새마을 운동하고 현재 하고 계시는 운동이 어떻게 in uh, from the beginning of the rural renewal campaign in 1970s back then life was difficult the rural renewal campaign in south korea has two rounds The new countryside campaign called for a right education, a right food system. That is the new countryside campaign. 
And in the second round of the movement, it focuses more on the future of the 21st century. So for all countries, we should preserve our own rural areas. And based on this principle, we can carry out the second round of new countryside movement in South Korea and in all other countries. For the second question, some friends of me financed our project a lot. They supported me to carry out this project for as long as 10 years. With the subsidy and grants, I've been dedicated in this area for a decade. Based on this, we expanded our organization to its today's scale. Thank you for the answer. Uh, his answer is based on his ex experience. So, uh, but uh, he want to reevaluate the agri sector, not only as a production base, but also as a, the cultural and sometimes artistic uh, dimensions. So, uh, so. So based on that plan, so more young people can be devaluated also and demystified uh, by the capitalistic growth-oriented economic development. So he, he already uh, highlighted those results of growth-oriented myth uh, resulted in more conflict and the devastation their own life, quality of life. So uh, fortunately, many of young people and uh, retired people realized that uh, part and uh, they, they try to reevaluate the rural life uh, in these days. So because he showed the example uh, what the rural life is there. So for that, Rural community themselves should change itself, not only stick to the old tradition, uh, they, they should be more future oriented in, uh, in, in challenging new horizons in, for the 21st century. So thank you for all the relevant answers uh, on the questions. So is there any other questions? Then we will move to China. <laughs> so, uh, such a um, so, Yan Xiaohui uh, will share his experience and uh, also wisdoms to all of us. Now, uh, your floor is yours. Will you start? Dear professors, it is my honor and pleasure to be invited into this webinar to share with you my thoughts on rural regeneration. Among all the speakers, I'm a young generation, but I have been participating in the rural construction for two decades. A few days later, the 19th July, marks the establishment of the first farmer training school in China in a new century. It is called the Yeyang Tu Rural Construction Institute. So four days later, we, have, we will have a forum. And the friends who have been working together in rural construction will gather there and make a review and conclusion of our work over the past two decades. 
And I look forward to you to participate in that forum. And we will share some experience at that forum. In China, when we talk about rural construction and rural movement, we have two decades of experience with a wide social network. This network includes the students from universities and the intellectuals who go to rural areas and the young people who return to their hometowns. They organize the farmers to do farming production and help them create their businesses. And some even move to the rural areas and live there. And many youngsters have lived rural areas to city areas in the 1980s and 90s, but later then they go back to the rural areas. There are many of them. And there are also many urban citizens who have been living there and getting tired of the pressure in the cities. And they, they go to the rural areas regularly or from time to time to experience a different lifestyle. But anyway, the most important group in the rural construction are the farmers. And in China, there is a special occasion that is half of the farmers. split their time in the rural and urban areas. They spend half of their time working in the rural areas and they spend half of their time working in the urban cities. So for farmers who stay in rural areas all the time and for farmers who work in rural areas and urban areas half and half, they are the main groups in China's agriculture. And I would like to here share the experience about agriculture because I was born in the rural areas and I grew up there and I majored in agriculture and I have been participating in the agricultural work since I graduated. And I have many experiences in different periods and works over the two decades. And I believe that these experiences and reflections can be helpful. So I want to share with you two takeaways about rural construction. First, as an organizer of this forum, I want to talk about why we need to discuss the rural construction in Asia. We talk about Asian rural agriculture, and it is very important to share the experiences and takeaways among different regions. These works are very important. But what I'm thinking about is that how can we use and coordinate all these experiences in the practice of agriculture in one single region? In other words, we carry out the rural construction in different regions. But how can we roll out a sustainable method in the base and the primary level of the rural construction? In other words, we are not comparing our economic performance, and we are not talking about our industrial level or the development of our cities and localities, let alone the 
military capabilities among different countries. What we talk about in discussing the rural construction, we look at the sustainability at the rural, at the grassroots level in the rural areas. Instead of the competitive side of a nature, of a country, because we like to talk about the comparison and the competitive nature in the country's development, which is centered around the ideology of developmentalism and national competition. But I think in talking about rural construction, we can let alone these issues and from a pure perspective of the rural construction to build connections and share experiences. We have heard, of, uh, heard from the Japanese and Korean speakers and they have mentioned that there is a rural decline in these countries and we have witnessed the efforts made by the different groups in rural construction. They have shared many interesting experiences. And I want to add that we have a shared heritage of sustainable farming in Asia. And this heritage includes the social, the cultural and philosophical common history link. So first I want to say that we are not talking about developmentalism, not about the comp competition or the comparison. We just want to talk about our experience over the past thousands of years of sustainable social development and our common future in agriculture. So this is my first statement. I want to look at the future construction from the perspective of the mainstays of rural agriculture, which are the farmers instead of the big companies. So in this South South Sustainability Forum, we focus on the theme of looking at new horizons. So we want to uh, uh, let alone the national competition, we want to look for cooperation and solidarity, especially in the primary level to seek for common sustainability. So even though we may be competitors in some sense, but the solidarity and cooperation is more important. To combat the capitalism and the new colonialism. And let alone the competition among regions. So that's why I want to focus on the rural construction and the experience sharing. So this is the first point. Another takeaway, the second takeaway, is that we are now facing the destruction from developmentalism and its modernity. From the perspective of developmentalism, rural areas are considered as a decline and region that is lagging behind. And rural areas are taken as a poor region, which must be developed into a rich region. And this is an economic perspective. And the process from poor poverty to richness 
has a dependence on the ecological resources. So when we talk about the rural decline, we take a developmental perspective and place the city as the center, which focus on attracting the people from the rural areas and taking advantage of the farming lands. So by construction, the rural poverty, it has become a vicious circle where our living conditions are taken as merely resources. We are no longer people, people. Instead, we are taken as resources and, and capitals. For example, we have migrant workers who work between rural and urban areas. They are taken as resources, as labor resources, and then consumers. So in this perspective, the rural society is now in a passive and strange logic circle. We need to change this situation. We need to make more efforts in the rural construction. We need to promote more innovative and sustainable development methods. It is hard. And currently we have not shed the vicious circle. And we are now in dilemma. For example, when we, are do, when we do the rural work, we are criticizing the capitalism. But at the same time, we need the money and capital and the bonds in our rural works, especially when we want to make some strategies. And our strategies for the promotion of agriculture then turns into a profit strategy. We have to use the capital and business and competitive logic in our work. Even though we want to promote social business, want to promote the public benefits, but somehow we are still trapped in the capitalism logic. And it has challenging to embrace a social practice that is non-capitalism, non-money-driven, and non-competitive. For example, some people go to the rural areas because they want to provide help and assistance to local farmers. For example, like helping them with organic methods, to provide them with trainings, but at the same time, they need to run their own farms and do some businesses or financial businesses. But when they're there, the basic needs in the rural areas cannot be solely supported by the local community. For, in, for, uh, for example, they cannot be self-sufficient and their, uh, the goods and the groceries cannot be supported in local areas. And let alone the education and medical resources, they cannot be self-sufficient. We have tried to run local schools, local nursing care centers to use the traditional Chinese medicine for health guarantee and for better health care. But 
it's not enough, and we need to use the money to introduce more of these resources into the community. They need exterior help, and they need to get profits to sustain their job. So in the production and the selling of agriculture, is also faced to the necessity of cooperation with the big companies, the marketing and the profit counting and all other normal norms and rules in business operations. We have to adapt to these rules and we have to seek the profits. But in this process, we are again in the trap of capitalism. So this is not in line with our original aspiration. And there is marketing competitivity or even opposite positions. For example, we need to compete with each other. And when we rent the farmland, we need to negotiate the prices of the land. Or we need to hire local labor. So these are all about prices. So even though our original aspiration is to help the farmers, but later on, we have to face the problem of competing with the local farmers or even the conflicts. So we have to think about why can't we shed and get away from these oppositions in rural construction. I think to solve this problem in a society of capitalism, we need to focus on people, focus on the we production, on the people production. We have seen the occupation of capitalism in the rural production, in the sustainable construction. We are looking for people who work in agriculture, we are looking for people, but they are influenced by the capitalism environment. Therefore, the subjectivity in agricultural production is ignored. So, under this circumstances, how can we produce food for people who can sustain their livelihood and environment? It is our solution, we are sunk into all types of crisis. We can discuss the crisis of environment, ecosystem, capitalism, structure, deglobalization, etc. We all have a say here. In today's world, it is dominated by financial assets and financial capital. Originally speaking, in Japan, China, South Korea, our grassroots practices are confined by a lot of obstacles and the peasants labor in their farmland cannot turn out enough harvest and their harvest is not well valued, and their value is also minimized and marginalized by the financial assets and the financial capital all over the world. For example, in China, for each peasant, they may have about one more of farmland, but the yield of that range of land is about 1,000 RMBUM. As calculated, 
maybe some peasants are at a loss. So they work hardly for a whole year. And the same amount of labor may produce much more value and much more money in other types of financial activities. So their labor is minimized by other types of financial activities. So the production of labor force is minimized and marginalized by financial activities. I think in China, in Japan, in South Korea, the conditions are quite similar. So under such a condition, what we care about is to find more solutions and talents who can address the current problems, who can reevaluate re -evaluate the rural activities. We have done a lot of training for college students, a lot of training targeted for peasants. We also do our own farmlands. We also do training for the consumers, the citizens. We also help enterprises to transform themselves for the new scenario, but with more and more obstacles. We have realized that the training for the young should be prioritized. Our local knowledge reproduction should be pre should be put at our top priority. So in recent years, with the use of internet, we carry out a lot of promotion, popularization work. 20 years ago or decades ago, in rural developments, our work tended to be marginalized. And our long-term argue against capitalism has put ourselves on the edge of the world. And our discussion is confined within a very limited area. But those thoughts have been accepted very well among the young in China. Some of them even go popular in China. So the global universities, South South Forum on Sustainability have gained a lot of attention on the internet in China, thanks to our popularization work and promotion work. Today, we have about hundreds of millions of people paying attention for our work. And we also have many attendees for our forum. Many attendees even participate in our discussion and work. This is new opportunity provided by the Global Youth South South Forum. The South South Forum focuses on the work away from capitalism and developmentism. I think our work can attract more young blood to pass on our work to the future generations. So even though we have more attendees, more participants and more attention we still face the unprecedented challenges as I mentioned in the previous part. In the unsustainable development condition, the grassroots, the peasants, the vulnerable groups are facing strong living pressure on the internet. We do not see a lot of say from the peasants. Many young people who wish to become middle class in the city and now returning back to the countryside. They are facing challenges of their sustainable livelihood. 
it is a common problem. So the young facing such problems are questioning the type of life in cities, in urban areas. Many of them even lose their confidence in urban development. This transformation is prominent. More and more young people are making their voices heard on China's internet. So what we can see on the internet are delivered by the young. Many more elderly peasants do not have a say here and their voices cannot be heard on the internet. They do not use internet a lot. But fortunately, more and more people are questioning the success defined by the capitalist. They do not admire capitalism anymore. So I think it is a prominent transformation. Even though many of us are losing our confidence on development, but we still are reviewing the scenario. Even though many of us may be very depressed, confused, and even choose to lie flat. What is different in China is that China's rural area is good enough and qualified enough to attract more people to go back to the countryside and embark on their new life here. I think we have a lot of good legacies in China's rural areas thanks to our revolutions, thanks to our history. And in many other countries, they also have their alternative solutions to attract more people go back to the countryside to start their living here. So we are encouraging people to go to countryside when they encounter so many difficulties in city life. In our work, today's focus is to organize people to do work in countryside, to seek for a new solution, to address the current problem. We need to combine our internet promotion work together with the practices in countryside. We see new opportunities and we are still confident enough for the development in China's rural areas. Thank you very much. That's all for my presentation. Thank you, Yang Xiaohui. <laughs> so based on, on your two decades experience, uh, based with all the challenges and obstacles, also uh, your hopes, to persuade more young people uh, to go back to rural community building rather than drifted by the harsh competition. So we, we are going to have in the afternoon uh, on the on question and answer session, but uh, if there are any questions on Yan Xiaohui's uh, presentation, will you? Do ask. Okay, everybody if might be hungry, <laughs> then uh, we have a very wonderful presentation uh, in East Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, and China. We, uh, as uh, Yan Xiaohui already has mentioned, uh, we have a common experience of uh, cultural tradition and uh, cherishing the agricultural sector as the backbone of our society. So, 
but the three countries are more deeply into rapid industrialization and uh, technology innovation, uh, not to uh, lose their positions in uh, global capitalistic competition. So how to recover our old traditions uh, in cooperation with each other uh, in this situation, I think it is very meaningful. We, we see the very rapid financialization and uh, um, the capitalistic uh, development in a very deformative way. Uh, so we are deeply influenced by those uh, trends, but uh, we still see the many hope, seed of hope in local, in local area and uh, like uh, uh, Ono-san in Japan, uh, his uh, 80 years uh, life has been devoted for the small farmers and uh, some kind of a correcting Japanese uh, urban oriented policy. So we have many friends who did this kind of activities and also even urban people, they want to be uh, correct consumers. And as uh, Chu Hyung No has uh, uh, constructed a new terminology, prosumer. So uh, co-producer co and co-consumer. So we want to uh, blur our line between rural and urban by ourselves also. So, with those kind of many challenges, we can find new horizons in this uh, seemingly pessimistic uh, situations. So in this, I I do because I first at first I attended the South South Forum. Uh, I didn't expect it can persist that much. So we we I really celebrate. 10th South South Forum on sustainability. Uh, it is not uh, so like Yan Xiaohui. Uh, he dedicated his life uh, for the cause of sustainability in China. So there are many good people, good person who try to make uh, this global South cooperation on sustainability and especially I deeply thankful for organizers Kinchi and Jade for their persisting effort. I will give my mic Kinchi. <laughs> so, thank you, Kinchi. Will you say something? Thank you, Jungkook. Um, uh, for Jungkook has been a, a persistent supporter and sponsor of the South South Forum and has been has come to Hong Kong many times and she has also brought some students to come to attend the forums and this time uh, we thank you again for moderating the session in the afternoon we will have Andrew uh, moderate the session so uh, we will come back in two hours and first have our um, a Korean speaker and another uh, Chinese speaker to talk about this topic. Then we will have one and a half hours of a round table dialogue. Uh, during that dialogue, we hope the speakers this morning and this afternoon will be discussing some of the issues, such as uh, questions about alternatives and what are the kind of difficulties we, we all face together and how in East Asia we could be uh, fostering more solidarity and understanding among the people. And there is so much we can be learning from each other. So thank you all again, and please come back uh, in two hours. So my final uh, thanks to uh, interpreters. So in East Asia, we are geographically closer and historically very close, but because of language barriers, we cannot communicate easily in this kind of global webinar, especially with the English is dominant. So thanks for, for your endeavors. We can communicate in more deep, deeper level uh, 
uh, speaking in their own language because many farmers uh, they cannot speak any foreign language so we can we, we can reevaluate their experience thanks to your uh, bridging activity thank you again thank you